Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of Path to the Priesthood, the podcast where we sit down with Orthodox clergymen from around the country, and we ask them what it was that inspired them to serve Christ's church. My name is Christo Papadimus, and I'll be your host. We have a very special guest for you today, uh, a good friend of mine, Father Alexander Eliabis. Uh, but before we uh, turn the floor over to Father Alexander, let's hear a little bit about him. Father Alexander Eliabis is Bay Area born and raised and grew up attending Nativity of Christ in Novato. He graduated UC Davis, majoring in history and minoring in religious studies. And after a year of work in San Francisco, he began at Holy Cross in 2015. That's right. Uh, in the summers between, he was a regular counselor at St. Nicholas Ranch and summer camp, and also Saint, All Saints Camp in Arizona. It was at All Saints Camp that he met his now wife, Presbytera Laura, and they now have a son, Max. Father Alexander now serves and loves it at the Holy Trinity Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Phoenix. Welcome, Father Alexander. Thank you for having me, Christo. Good to see you. It's, a, it's, a nice, it's nice to see you. It's been a long time. So yeah. Father Alexander and I actually uh, overlapped for three years at the seminary. Uh, but before that, I, I believe... I, I, I think we met at camp. It was definitely, it was all the way back in summer of 2013, I think, at St. Nick's. Yeah. It was when, in orientation, we were staying at that house, I think, right at the front of the road. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. For those of you who've been to St. Nicholas Ranch, um, yeah. you know how much how much fun orientation can be for the counselors. Right. And uh, so, dude, we go back way back then, and at that point, maybe I had known that I would be going to the seminary one day. Yeah. But I think that, that would have been that probably would have been the summer before you went, right? Yeah, of course, because I went in 2014. So yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So that probably would have been. I I think I might have had one more year of undergrad, or maybe I graduated before my year year between but yeah gotcha so that's yeah. where that's so this this period of time where obviously we met in 2013 and then uh the next time i saw you is when you showed up on campus at uh, holy cross in 2015 so yeah. why don't you uh we're going to turn the floor over to you now and uh, why don't you tell us your story about your journey to the priesthood and you can begin as far back as you would like to go i think there are some interesting um you know events here in your life that our listeners will love to hear about so father alexander take yeah. it away thank you <clears throat> well i mean first again it's, it's good to see you and thanks for having me on and it's a really really cool project that you're working on now getting people to tell their stories and maybe inspire some more some more people to at least go to seminary and and see if that's their their calling so thank you i appreciate it it's, it's been a lot of fun yeah yeah and you, you know, you get to know people better, I'm sure too. So it's, it's fun. Yeah. Um, my story, well, I was born and uh, no. Um, so my, it's funny, kind of the, my parents are the classic sort of married into story. My dad was born and raised, you know, his parents were Greek in Lowell, Massachusetts. That's right. Um, grew up going to church, you know, all these sorts of things. And which church in Lowell, if I can ask, was it Holy Trinity? So, well, so his dad was actually the mayor of Lowell for a little bit. And so in order to assuage both political sides, he went to both. Yes. One of his, he was, as even funnier, he was assigned to Holy Trinity and his other brother went to Transfiguration. Look at that, so just level. To, in order to make sure everyone's happy, yeah, they went to both churches every Sunday. And then his younger brother kind of floated between the two. Cool. Um, so, you know, very, very strong connection to the faith as a child. And then... You know kind of lived his life and got to the point where he later on married my mother and before they were going to get married i always i like to tell the story where he says you know you know before before we get married you know you have to you have to become greek my mom you know red hair skin oh. like she's like I'm, she's like i'm not i'm not really sure how i can become <laughs> how does one just become yeah, yeah become greek and he said well you get baptized all these things and so long story short she you know they got married in the church, all of these things. And she began to question, you know, like, hey, what happens before the Lord's Prayer and the liturgy? Maybe we should go a little bit before this. Yeah. And so she really was the one who took up the, the torch of, of learning about the faith. And sooner or later, we began, you know, going as a family at the beginning of liturgy. Um, and so really, by the time I was born, I'm the youngest of three. I have an older sister, older brother. Um, for as long as I can remember, we were going from the beginning of liturgy onward every Sunday. And then actually we're, um, 
because of different circumstances of moving school districts and things, we actually started homeschooling when oh. I was during the third grade. Okay. Um, and so that gave us a little bit more freedom, actually, to the point where we were able to go to weekday services and different things like that. Yeah, um, at that point, you, your, your parish is uh, Novato, right? You're yeah, the, growing up was Nativity of Christ in Novato, yeah. Father Kostov Sathiu was your yeah. child priest? That's yes. awesome, man. That's, and he, uh, he sort of became our, you know, de facto papu in a sense. We'd see him, you yeah. know, three or four times a week, and we'd go out to breakfast with them afterwards. So that was, that was formative in and of itself, you know, to be able to be, A, in the services, um, and B, to be around, you know, a, a priest like Father Constantine. For um, sure, one of a kind, and I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, to this day, he's he's well into his 80s, I believe, and still, like, you know, serving the church as a retired clergyman, and he's he's uh, filled in at the cathedral in San Francisco for us many times, and I always, I really do, man, I appreciate having him around, because just his sermons and everything, it's kind of, I feel like I'm back in the chapel just purely yeah. learning, you know, here's a man that knows so much about everything, yeah. it's just, so he's uh, he's a very uh, a special priest to have as your your child yeah. priest. And he's, I mean, because of I think because of him, he's produced, you know, Father Pizza Terrace from our parish, Father oh. Paul Chubenbach, who's now in the Antiochian uh, Archdiocese. But so he's he's produced a, a few clergymen from, and, and I think a lot do from his, you know, tutelage and his, just his example, you know. For so, sure, definitely. Something to aspire to. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, so we were able to go in the weekdays. And again, kind of abbreviating as much as I can, not, not too, too much detail. It was something that we we and kind of ingrained the faith in, in our life and in our our way in growing up. You know, we did prayers every night as a family. We sure. having, you know, this ability to homeschool, we were able to do prayers as a family in the morning, read the lives of saints, the scripture of the day, you know, set aside 15, 20, 30 minutes every morning to do that as a as a family to kind of learn about the church and to pray and and have this sort of foundation. Um, and so that was always really I mean the the home is the first church after all it definitely sounds like it was for you that's that's amazing yeah no my mom my mom did a very purposeful job and my dad you know kind of after a while you know bought in was like okay yeah this is this is yeah. something good um yeah. and so I think we had a I had an interesting just academic path in that I was homeschooled until I was about 14 and then I started full-time at the uh, junior college and so by the time wait what I was, by the time I was, uh, yeah, 14, I was full-time at the junior college. <laughs> what? I, yeah. How did I not know that? That's unreal. Yeah, did. How... A long ago fact. Yeah. Look at that, yeah. Yeah. So we start, I was there for two years, two and a half, or somewhere around there. Basically, by the time I was 17, I started at uh, UC Davis as a, basically as a junior um, in college. And so was able to take a little bit of time there, too, so I didn't have to, you know, rush through you know two years of college yeah, you got the college experience you yeah. rowed at did you row at uc yeah. davis yeah i was on the the rowing team at uc davis and that was i mean that was in and of itself for those of you people who are you know at my parish i probably every two months or so probably work in some sort of rowing metaphor into a sermon or something because it really was able to it teaches you a lot of life lessons as any you know sports do you as a the sports a metaphor I'm, I'm guilty of it as yeah. well I, I but i can't resist like it's, it's like i know it's, it's I off the fall. yeah it's too easy and and it, they truly are formational and there's a lot of parallels um to spiritual formation with any formation and so i can't resist the football as yeah. well so, but yeah yeah i mean you think you know askesis is working out and boom you, you connected the whole the whole idea of you know there's never a point when you're you know when you're a, an athlete that you're like, yeah, I've, I've done enough. I'm good. You know, yeah, you keep, I'm playing, set. keep pushing, yeah. you know, and the same thing in the spiritual life, there's never a point where you're like, yeah, I'm good to go. You know? Yeah. Now. Yeah. I, I've guaranteed my salvation. Yeah, guaranteed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there's, I mean, there's so many examples I'm working in all the time. Um, but I think my, my college experience in a sense was, was interesting because I, I started, um, I was there for three years. My first year, kind of the sort of classic first semester away at college. I was about an hour away from home and would go home almost every weekend, you know, go yeah. see the parents and kind of still touch base at home. By end of my first year, that became a little less frequent. Um, and, and of course, you go home, you go to church on Sunday. Um, my second year was really where it kind of 
kind of, you know, we had practices on Sundays sometimes, we had races on Sundays sometimes, the other Sundays was, you know, tired. My only day that I could sleep in because we practiced, you know, Monday through Saturday. Um, so my church attendance sort of sort of fell off in the second year. Well, especially in Davis, man, you're really the closest church to you would be, I guess, Annunciation Sacramento, but that's yeah. Man, that is that's it's still a half hour sort of for yeah. a college kid after like you know going that it's it's not easy that's yeah so there's, there's not a, a beautiful small little Antiochian parish in West Sacramento but still oh, it's yeah. you know, fifteen minutes away and you know yeah so it, that was a great excuse you know to on a <laughs> yeah right yes. oh, <laughs> I would but yeah yeah and so but it was interesting kind of <clears throat> I think by the second year. Um, was really by the end of the second year I started to feel a little bit of that tension in my life you know of something's okay, missing I'm obviously like not not fully committing to the church I'm obviously I'm still you know not fully committing to not church yeah and I kind of I think the way I've, I've put it a few times I think is was on that fence and kind of felt like well there's no being on the fence doesn't really help anybody either you know you dive fully into the church or you know you just get off and see you later yeah and i thankfully was kind of i think around there um my second year we had a really small but really tight-knit ocf maybe oh when i mean small like three four people i mean that's more than more members. than many colleges I will yeah. Say, so that, yeah well out of, out of those three four people you know i became a priest and one of them became a nun so it was, it was oh. a good, good ratio out of that three or four yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's quite an ocf program they yeah. had at davis <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we most especially the the one uh who became a nun later we we kind of i think we sort of unspokenly were on the same path of like okay well we're not really fully committing but maybe if we hold each other accountable and we actually really even just the two of us began to kind of pray together, you know, do the pedagogies together every once in a while, you know, she'd be like, hey, Friday afternoon, let's pray, you know, and so we do the pedagogies, that kind of thing, just to almost keep each other honest a little bit, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and the same way, you know, Sunday morning, you know, she would need a ride, I would need to pick her up, or she'd be like, hey, let's drive. And so that was a really, really, in a sense, spiritually beneficial relationship in that she was able to hold me accountable I was able to hold her like hey let's go to church let's figure this out let's pray yeah. more let's read and so um although it was a very small OCF it was really a it was a really a important one I think yeah and so then my third year was kind of a little bit more of the same a little bit you know still kind of testing the waters of like maybe I'll you know we'll all go to church but then it's really when I began to own the faith, I think, for myself a little more when I first really started to pray on my own, yeah. really started to do everything on my own. And I think until anyone reaches that point, um, not so much your faith is worthless or dead or something, but it's it's a lot of still like, you know, oh, I do this because I, you know, it's what I'm told or what I always have done. But until you kind of, you have that, your own relationship with Christ, I think, um, that's when it kind of takes off, I think, for anyone. Sure, for sure. Um, and so I think by that third year, there was there were some more, you know, hints in my mind of, hey, I think, you know, seminary might be something I might want to pursue. And like I said in the bio, and we said at the beginning, between all the all those summers, um, I was working at the summer camp for the metropolis uh -huh. um, and working, no, I don't think I worked down at All Saints in Arizona yet. Um, yeah, just working at the Metropolis, um, and that for, you know, four weeks really to me, because I think growing up, I had such a strong foundation of the faith of, you know, of knowing the saints of praying and all these things, and then having so many of the campers come in and, you know, just telling them the lives of saints who they have no idea were even Never like, of, yeah. people and, you know, even ministering in this small way really fulfilled me and really showed, I think that that there are kid, the kids, you know, have this hunger and desire and that it's something that I was blessed with that I take for granted. I need to yeah. be able to, to share it. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, you talked about ministering in, in a small way at summer camp, but I, it's, it's funny, like some of those um, casual, like conversations, like 
um, you know, stories about the lives of the saints or whatever, um, ones that the kids would find it interesting. So those are probably like the most um, beneficial or like powerful moments of ministry. I think it's it's much easier at camp because you have all the fun things at camp. You have the services, so they're kind of in the mindset, but they're not in church. They're not distracted. You know, they're not leaving to go home in a little bit. And so it is. It's on the downtime. Um, when like the real questions or like the real kind of like, you know, faith can begin to build. It's like, it's, it's really interesting. The difference between like, um, you know, the kids' mindset, like at a summer camp compared to like, even like, you know, coffee hour, um, trying to catch some, like, you know, before, after basketball practice or dance practice, like maybe you'll say, you know, a prayer together with them. And then it's like, boom, off and yeah. on to what they're doing. So man, those, those summer camp, um, moments are, are really important and uh so to have you how how many years in a row did you do saint nick's you were one of the veterans i remember you had you know you I started, the, yeah i started the year before now father jacob kind of took over so i guess that was 20 summer of 2011 i think maybe 2012 so like five solid years ish so about, I mean, by, the, by the time i finished seminary a solid seven years i think wow that's amazing um, yeah yeah so yeah but even before seminary all my summers in college so like all three four summers when i was in college and after um so it was definitely i mean it was a big part of my life in the sense that it was the first time that i really did minister to people and i don't know it was, it, it was a really fulfilling thing but not even in the sense of like wow, doesn't this make me feel good? I'm doing, right, look at me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's just and, like, it's like a good, yeah, it's good. Um, I don't know how to describe the feeling either. You, it's like a very, um, just very positive atmosphere, very like healthy well, environment. Yeah. It allows you, it allows you, it's an environment that allows you to be Christ-centered without, you know, forcing, forcing it. Forcing, yeah. Because there, because you're praying all it, but you know the classic thing that, you know, Father Jacob would say, you know, we pray before we pray, we pray, you know, you're just praying all the time. You're doing all these Christ-centered things. And that's sort of the, the part that, you know, I think a lot of people will say they understand, but kind of miss, I think about camp, you know, it's like, oh, camp is so wonderful and loving. And when it's like, well, it's not a, the ac it's not an accident. It's not just because of this camp thing. It's because you're praying so much. You're doing all these things centered around the church, you know? Right. right. So it really is it really is a transformative place if you let it be in a sense you know actually a lot, a lot of parallels between um any of the metropolis summer camps i would imagine and Iron village of course and the seminary itself you know it's a yeah. it's a little um it's a little not yeah it is kind of like just like a village where everyone's kind of like uniquely you know because you know, out in the world, we're pulled a million different directions. We have a million different things going on, but like all environments focused on Christ and like whether whether directly or indirectly, like even the fun yeah. uh, games and stuff. It's all like fun in the setting of the church. It's a very special. Yeah, everyone's place. everyone's headed in the same direction. Even yeah. if you're doing, you know, playing a basketball game, maybe you won't lose your temper. Who who would who lost? Who would lose? Their yeah, temper? I mean, competitive uh, people uh, in camp sports. I can't but, imagine. Yeah. yeah. Seminary, losing your touch, no. <laughs> yeah, seminary, five what? football. That's, the, that's the, the classic story of when the Celtics used to practice at the seminary and they were right. you know, warming up in the gym above and they were watching all the seminarians play and all these things happen and they're like, these guys are going to be priests? Like, what is <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so so you, you were doing summer camp um, every year uh, yeah. between college at UC Davis. And then, but at what point... Um, at what point did you make the decision like, yes, I am going to go to the seminary or the decision like, yes, maybe the priesthood is for me. How, what was that process like? So it was really, it was really my senior year. You know, you get to the point senior year in college, you're like, well, I gotta know what I'm doing with my life kind of thing. Definitely. Uh, and being a history major, you know, there's not a whole lot. Which is very cool, by the way, because I was a political science major, but I often say yeah. if, I could go, if I could go back and major in anything, it would be history, just because I feel like you yeah. can understand, you know, the world so much better. Yeah. Um, that is cool. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it really was a great major and a great, UC Davis was a great place to be and had a really, really interesting experience as a religious studies minor too. It didn't, only took like four or five classes. Um, 
but I think even even that was interesting because I took like an Abrahamic religions class and essentially oh. the professor the whole time was like well we know everything in the Bible is false we know everything that here oh, is false wow. like, and so really kind of you know looking back it would have been you know maybe nice to go back and have a chat with him but it, it really was something that <laughs> kind of kind of tests your faith in a, in a way that I think a lot of times especially with just a normal sort of Sunday school education you're not really at all prepared for no you're not not really to, coming, yeah to it, engage in dialogue with a colleague yeah. in no way yeah like well I've always been told this but you've been told wrong oh okay hey, you know, that, that reminds me I took a I took a it was just called the class was Christianity at San Diego State and you know I think um, orthodoxy got like half of one lecture like throughout the year yeah. and like the main thing was like the professor was like did you know in the greek orthodox church priests are allowed to get married and the whole class was like what <laughs> like they found that was outrageous and like i anyway you know, moving it, on <laughs> yeah it was literally and that was it and like they almost people seem to like you know oh that makes orthodoxy not legitimate if that's the and i and again i had that feeling i was like i want to you know i want to raise yeah. my hand and say something but dude you are not equipped uh, yeah. as, as a young college kid to engage anyway that that's yeah. funny there's a there's I had, I had actually another class that was taught by an orthodox professor oh. she was she was a convert not not too long a convert like maybe 3 or 4 years um, and she taught actually a class just on the gospel of john which also was very interesting because, you know, obviously she wasn't trying to be overtly orthodox and Christian, but she had so many good points in there. I actually learned a lot from there. And that was actually a part of, you know, what kind of pushed me a little bit more towards cool. the faith, which was, which is, you know, always interesting. And I'd like to maybe go back and find her somewhere, but I don't remember her name. So <laughs> yeah, it makes it tough. It does. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, yeah. so, so yeah, here, yeah. So I was, kind of reaching the end of that semester and I was like well I guess I gotta apply to grad schools for history and I did sort of want to you know being a professor his professor was something I you know it wasn't like I don't want to be that I was like yeah I can see myself doing that and be something be fulfilling yeah um but then it really just literally came down to like doing the work of applying I actually was applying to um San Diego State and UCSD for, no for way. yeah but it really, I mean it got to the point of kind of just filling out the application and I don't even know if I submitted it. Yeah. And I just really couldn't. I had no sort of desire or drive to do that. I couldn't. And that, I mean, that's a sign right there too, because yeah. if it's something that you do feel that you're meant to do um, and you do feel like, um, yeah, this is this is where my life path is leading, then that stuff, like you just yeah. sit down and crank it out. I remember I had similar thoughts. Oh, will I be uh, a high school teacher will I go into like you know personal training but that was like time to get the certification I was like ah, yeah. Ah, yeah I just yeah so yeah. It, it's interesting but um but I think that's that's such a an issue in our society in general is like okay you've done this now what are you doing next and people almost feel you know pressured you know out of high school what are you going to do for the rest of your life out of college you know and it's getting earlier, earlier these days too. I, I feel like in, in middle school, especially because like in the Bay Area, private schools are big for high school. So it's yeah. like you know, these kid, little kids in middle school. What 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 uh, what private school are you attending next year? Are you doing yeah. your applications? It's, it's it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't really give room for really like the Holy Spirit to work and to like ponder and to think on anything. It's like you got to know. You got to know. You got to know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, I was blessed to be able to have you know, the kind of resources and things I'd worked through my last year or two of college and um, was able to save up a decent amount of money. And then actually one of our mutual friends, uh, Ethan, uh, oh. Ethan, yeah, he kind of texted, he all, all through summer camp. So I graduated, went to summer camp and all throughout camp, he was like, hey, I'm going to go to Greece for an undetermined amount of time. You should come with me. And I was like, no, I can't do that. Yeah, and yeah. And then, you know, almost every day, he's like, you should come, come on, you should come, just come with me, just come with me. I was like, no, you know, no, no. And then I went back to Davis, was living in the house I was living in, was working at, you know, Noah's Bagels. Nice. And I just came home from, from work one day and was like, all right. So I texted him, I was like, hey, scale one to 10, how serious were you? He was like, thousand percent, do it. <laughs> so, Very, yeah. So did it uh, that night, booked my flight for like a two, three weeks later um i was able to you know give my two weeks say see you later and went to greece with him and it was a really that was really i think a trip that really started a more of a, a fire i think because i was able to 
you know, we'd both been to Greece before and done the, you know, touristy, you know, beaches, this, that sort of thing. Um, and we were able to really just not relax, but just take in the country for what it is and, and the, the holiness and the, the people yeah. that are we're able to, we connected with a guy who he remembered from camp, George Demas from, from Portland. Oh, dude, no yeah. way. He George Demas living. and I have the same yeah. Renan who knows. So oh, yeah. yeah, something in the lobby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so he was, he was working on his master's in Thessaloniki and we connected with him and um, we were able to stay at my friend's family's home out there about an hour east of Thessaloniki. And then we connected with George and we're like, hey, we want to stay in the city. Can we stay with you? He's like, well, you can't really stay with me. I have a, you know, kitchen and a bedroom. And a small, I, yeah, those yeah. apartments and yeah, yeah, yeah. So he connected us with a family that lived there. They had about 10 kids and were just an amazing, very pious family, you know, like would occasionally go to Orthros and Vesper is just in the middle of the week at you know any point of the church down the street and Dude, that's what's amazing about Greece man yeah. like you said the holiness of it because you're in a place where um orthodoxy it's not it's not a minority it, it is like you know a fountain of orthodoxy yeah. and so you hear the little church bells at night when it's time for Vespers and it's like oh yeah this is going on if you're in Athens or Thessaloniki yeah at a yeah. variety of churches you can you know you can okay walk in you can worship whenever you want it's it's truly amazing um so so to be there at that point in your life it's uh, i'm sure it was very beneficial yeah we were there um we stayed with them for almost three maybe four weeks overall wow. um really really amazing family um and you know went to church did this did that hung out with them um and then also we're able to go to monathos for about a week Dude. Um, and we stayed there at Vigoriu, the monastery of Vigoriu, for, for a week. Where's Vigoriu? Is that in relation it's to... right Vigoriu? below Simono Petra on the west Whoa. side. Whoa! So it's, it's, okay, it's up there, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we stayed with the monk there, and it was interesting because, you know, I'd always sort of, you have these sort of ideas of Manathos of like, you know, oh, everyone, all these... Obviously, there are holy people, holy monks there. <laughs> yes, no, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not, not downplaying that at all. But you almost have this idea of like you have to like tiptoe around, and if you you don't yeah. do anything, then and it was it was fascinating, kind of living there with the monks, and, and I think once they realized that we weren't just you know feeding off of them and sitting around because we got there and we said, hey, how can we help? How can we like you yeah. know work for you guys and. So we helped make soap and all these things. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, we really kind of helped them out. And, and then you see that they, they really are just humans, just yeah. guys. They pray a lot and they do all these things. And so it almost, not in a bad sense, not in a sense of like, oh, then it no, you know, kind of removes the veil off, but it almost sort of demystifies this idea of, you know, like prayer and fasting and vigils and these things. It's just something that you do and it's not the sort of, unachievable unattainable oh that's what some you know crazy holy people do it's like oh right. this is a guy like me who's you know seeking christ and praying and fasting and being in church a lot and all these things and and on top of that you know the beauty of the churches and the services and the chanting and, and all of this um that was a really impactful thing i think for me to kind of see it just as them as human beings you know not that they're you know doing anything like we are they're still very holy they're praying and doing Definitely, these things but yeah. humans um, they are. it's interesting when we went to Xenofondos on um the senior trip it's like in in the services like it's very dark and you just see kind of like you know the shadows moving around and you're like whoa you know and like and that was my first experience we'd arrived like when it was time for vespers or something and it's kind of it's awe-inspiring but then you you see yeah. them like walking around through the day and you're like wait a minute like you know they're they're laughing yeah. they're interacting they're um um they are people just like uh just like you and me and the craziest part was like you know because there are a good amount of older monks with the long beards and and that it's easy to be like well okay this is like you know this is a holiness meant for other other kinds of people but then like a few monks walked by that were like the same age as me and we just like yeah. we just, like looked at each other I was like whoa um yeah. you know this is uh, you know this is so something we were, very human we, our, our first night there you know we get there in the afternoon we go to vespers and all the monks at the end of every vespers in the evening all the monks go and they venerate the icons in the front and they receive the abbot's yeah. blessing and they go back to kind of end the night 
And so all the monks had kind of gone through is trailing the end. And there's this old monk who's kind of sitting with us, um, kind of in the, in the lay person section. Yeah. And he taps me on the shoulder and he like sends me up. And I was like, oh, are we, are we go next. Oh, okay. go get the blessing. So I, so I went up and venerated some of the icons and I turned around. Nobody, nobody followed me. There's like 30 <laughs> people in the church all alone in the front area, kind of in this no man's land. And I kind of scurry back and, and I see him kind of like almost snickering there. I was like, Did, was that like a joke? And so we're there for a week. He doesn't know other pilgrims go and do that after any of the Vesper. Nothing really happens. And finally, sort of on our last day, he kind of, this other person's there. It's obviously his first day and he sends him up and he does it. And he sends this guy up in the middle. So it's obviously this joke that he plays. Of the Vesper. <laughs> I go running, kind of like, <laughs> not hazing, but like drinking. <laughs> yeah and he just kind of sends up a pilgrim to go walk up there and, and kind of look foolish and then come back and he, so he you know and you see that that's you know that's their life they they pray in these things but they you know are human beings and they enjoy each other and exactly they, yeah really yeah awesome. and it's sort of fun in that way yeah for sure for sure Very yeah cool. um so then we we came back and i still wasn't you know set set on it's not like i you know came back and applied the holy cross you know, okay. that day um i was able to um stay on my brother's essentially stay on my brother's couch for about eight months in san francisco he was working downtown um and i was able to uh, stay on his couch and i actually got i looked for a job and started working at cafe trieste in uh, north beach ah, nice. um, a, a wonderful little coffee shop for any of those interested um and Worked there and at the same time was still trying to help out actually um, at that time at Holy Trinity in, in San Francisco. Yeah. Kind of, and where I really got to know my now combato, now Father Nicholas Matrakos. Um, his dad's the priest there, Father Eris, uh, and um, he was chanting there. And I began chanting because well, I guess I could, I could sort of rewind the touch. Yeah. When I was about, when I was 13, well, when I introduced this part of the story, my sister uh, became a nun. And so she well, was- that long ago. I yeah. always wondered, so yeah. you were 13. Okay, and she was older than you. It's like 14 years now at the monastery. Whoa. Uh, yeah, maybe more. Um, so she, she, I mean, was just absolutely brilliant. Finished, you thought I was crazy. She started UC Berkeley at 16, graduated at 18, top of her class. Whoa. And then, a week later, I went to uh, the monastery, Life Giving Spring. A week later? A week later, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, she knew. Uh, uh, but she had been chanting at our church because we had a, another uh, very nice old Salty and he kind of had a downturn in health around that time. And so she had been chanting for the last few years that she was there. And then she went to the monastery and Father Constantine was kind of like, well, do you want to try it? And I was like, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, but sure, why not? <laughs> Um, and kind of just by ear would flood my way through the services, through Orthros every Which Sunday. It's really half the battle. I mean, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially, you know, not being trained, not having any sort of, you know, I kind of, you know, if someone would start on a tone, I'd be like, okay, I can kind of stay in this. Stick with this tune. You know, yeah. Make it work. Um, but had no idea if you were like, okay, do something in, you know, fourth. I'd be like, couldn't, you know. Yeah, couldn't tell, so, tell you what fourth is. that means, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'd been chanting essentially every Sunday, um, and then, you know, Holy Week and things like that, probably from when I was 15, 16, and then a little bit through college whenever I could. Um, and that too was also something that I think kind of snuck its way into my heart in a sense of kind of making the services more, A, going to Orthros every Sunday, you see that, you know, all the different texts and all the different prayers and you, you see that the calendar of the church you see the, yeah. the, hymns you see the, the oh it's the same thing every sunday and all but right. you know it really brings to life all the services and especially having to chant them especially not knowing what you're chanting you have to really read it yeah uh, and know what you're saying and so that i think had a, a part of me as well that i enjoyed it and i learned a lot doing it because you learn a lot of theology just by reading the hymns going through the hymns for sure yeah. And so then when I was in San Francisco, kind of working at the cafe, helping out, chanting at Holy Trinity, also helping out um, when Father Jacob Saylor was there at, at Holy Trinity as the youth director. Yeah. Um, 
doing things with him. And there was a really vibrant, really vibrant young adult ministry um, around that time too. Just happened to have a real perfect sort of whirlwind of really amazing people. Stars aligned and yeah. Yeah, it was like every every Sunday after liturgy, I wouldn't get, I mean, granted they started liturgy late, but I wouldn't get home till, you know, four because almost every Sunday, you know, 10, 10 or so of us would just go do something after church. And it was a really, awesome. really beautiful, beautiful group that just sort of blossomed out of, you know, an organic coming together at church. Yeah, cool. Um, anyway, so it was chanting and then trying to learn a bit, trying to pray, trying to figure out what in the world I was going to actually do with my life. Probably wasn't going to work at the cafe the rest of my life. You're right. And so by March of, I guess that would have been 2015, I was kind of like, all right, you know, I'm not doing anything here. I think this is something I want to do. It's something I think I guess I'm being called to do. Unfortunately, no angel came down from heaven and, you know, gave me this message and told me I need to do oh, it. Hi. It often so, doesn't work like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, I'm so, sure you were inspired. You're like, man, that Christo Papadimus guy is the real <laughs> great angel that came and told him, you know, he knows what he's doing. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so by, by about March, I applied and then, you know, was working with them and probably by end of April, May had everything in, um, applied and really, really that's when I got a lot of, a lot of peace. I mean, obviously there's that anxiety of not knowing what in the world is going to happen at seminary. What is seminary? You know, yeah, like, exactly. Really, you yeah. know. I that's what I was curious about too is as I wondered what your knowledge of the school was before you went because for a lot of us on the west coast um dude I, ha I had literally no idea yeah. my, my dad graduated from there you know um in the 80s and uh you know I didn't I didn't know what it was what it looked like um I, I guess I knew what the chapel looked like and um yeah, and I just remember that first time driving around campus, just being like, because, uh, you know, going from yeah. like San Diego State or Davis, you know, my dad's like, my dad was loving it. He's back. He's like, there's the chapel. I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty. And he goes, there's the classroom building. I was like, oh, wh where are the other classroom buildings? And he was like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, that's obviously one hall. Like, what yeah. He's like, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> and that was all you needed. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, so yeah. you were you're applying, you're, yeah. So I'd actually been there, I forgot when I, when we came back from Greece that year that, so I was there for a total of about three, four months. Um, when we came back, we actually stopped in Boston um, and stayed with another guest you had on your show, Father Chris Rotellis. Oh, no way. Yeah, we stopped over for like two nights and stayed with them. Um, so and, much connections, yeah. 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 And didn't, I mean, we didn't really, we didn't really look around the school a lot. We were pretty tired from our trip and everything. So we just kind of slept out with them, um, but got a little bit of a taste for it, you know, kind of figured out there was only one classroom building. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and then, but really, I mean, if you had asked me before I went, what does Hellenic College mean and what does Holy Cross mean? I, would, uh, I you know, for a while I even was like, well, it's Hellenic College is seminary and Holy Cross is the other, you know, like I wasn't really sure even which, which was which and yeah. You just kind of hear like Clinic College, Holy Cross, and Seminary, yeah. Boston, you know, these things. And yeah, it's like Brookline. And Brookline, it sounds like Brooklyn, yeah. but it's not Brooklyn. It I, like, yeah, I have oh, no idea what, what goes on yeah. on the East Coast. Yeah. yeah. New York and Boston, the same city. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I applied, got in all that stuff, worked summer camp um, that summer in 2015. And then, yeah, I guess sort of just moved on out and had, I, thankfully again, my, so I have a few relatives out there as well. My, both my uncles on my dad's side still live in the area. Cool. Um, and my, at the time, my dad's cousin had, was living in Boston. So we stayed with him for the first night I was there, kind of got my feet under me and then went to the school. And I remember, I remember I was actually the first one there and move in day. And so there was all, you know, <laughs> lined up and got the whole yeah thing that's right yeah. it was super yeah, which, is, which is awesome that they do that for those of you that don't know they the um the volunteer students like actually help you you arrive at the seminary uh to the dorm building with all your you know boxes and things to move in and people actually carry your stuff for you into your your dorm building and that was probably the most efficient move i've ever experienced in my life <laughs> all the rest it's been just me just yeah. me and my family but like you know yeah. it was it was very helpful uh freshman year yeah. This is, uh, yeah 
yeah, it was great. And kind of, you know, I just remember it being real hot, humid. Well, I'd actually, yeah. I'd actually been for Crossroad, I guess that was probably at that point then like six years before that. Um, and I remember then was actually, it was a super hot week and they actually had to go out and buy fans for each one of us in our rooms because there's no AC norms. And yeah. Yeah. I remember just like sitting on the bed with, you know, no sheets, just like holding the fan above my face. Yeah, kind of man. Oh man, that brings it back. To life. You know, it, it was it was a little toasty, but thankfully in the school year it doesn't really get that bad. Right. It, you it's just a couple of weeks at the beginning. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or it gets <laughs> freezing cold. <laughs> yeah. But then it's nice and warm. They turn the heater on. It's great. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember. So I remember probably one of my first like memories of things happening was it might have been that night that we moved in or maybe the next night they did sort of the you know target run with everyone um and i went to target and i remember kind of just like sitting in the back seat of that like you know 18 passenger van with i still remember who it was it was you know my now father john sakalas next to me and then another classmate i think it was um no you know it was john zc was next to me who i know oh, no yeah that's yeah. right who yeah. i'd known from from camp um, yeah, and you guys and I, had a fun class. You you guys had a good group. You did. Yeah. yeah. No, we still we still have a really close connection. You know, a good core of eight or eight or ten of us really yeah. really close. Um, and I just remember kind of I was almost sort of on that that ride because you think you think kind of going into seminary you're like I don't know about you but at least me I was like well I'm not going to know anything. Everyone's going to know like the highest levels of theology and they're just going to finish off their degree, you know, and I'm going to not know anything. And then dude, that's how I felt till the end. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> what what is this? Eric? Yeah, what uh, is this? yeah. What is what class? What is theology? Um <clears throat> no, and I remember kind of again that sort of human element, realizing that okay, you know, these people are still seeking as well. They're still, you know, learning as well. They're still on their journey to Christ as well. Not and, experts, not you. Yeah. Yeah, and so it really, and I think that bonds you too because you, you know, you all are on your separate journeys, but you can move forward together, you know, in finding Christ and in in, in finding your vocation as well. Because you know, as as we mentioned, a few, you know, a few people in our class who then didn't go on to be priests in the ordination track, they've moved on to other things, but they got their, you know, theological degree, and so they'll be able to serve the church in another capacity that also and that's needs to, that's so crucial too, man. To yeah. have like to have parish council members maybe, or, or whatever it may be, but people yeah. who like taken, set aside the time to go to study the faith at the one place in the country where you can find out literally anything you want to know yeah. and to have lay leadership like that in, in a parish, it's really, it'd be invaluable really. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is, so God bless those people that like, uh, that do, they, they stop by, they get their degree and they move on to, you know, explore other, um, you know, either careers or, um, you know, pass in education and uh, so yeah. that, that was something I was surprised about the seminary too is that there were it was a lot more than people headed for um you know what what was you were on the seminarian track I believe it was called if you're going yeah. for ordination but so yeah, yeah very interesting note about the seminary there yeah 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 so it was it's kind of it was a time of you know not really knowing what in the world was going on but really really feeling at home at the same time too you sure know? Yeah. Kind of kind of like um, you know, a summer camp experience, or whatever. Cause you remember as for anyone who's been a camp counselor, it's like, okay, yeah, maybe you know one or two people, but it's like, you know, you're going to be a counselor, you're thrown, especially Ionian Village was a big one. You're thrown in yep. this group. Of, I don't know, you don't know any of these people, um, but you're all coming from the same place, hopefully headed towards the same place. And that's a very special um bond and it, it gives you the opportunity to make some of the best friends uh of your life. You know, people told me before. I was going to the seminary and even Ironing Village, you'll meet uh, people that are, you're gonna be in their weddings, they're gonna be in your weddings, you're gonna baptize each other's kids. And I was like, ah, you know, maybe, cause you're comparing to like your, you know, your best friends yeah. from school and stuff. And sure enough, you know, I've become a new no for one. Um, I've, yeah. been, I've been in like a bunch of weddings for other ones. So it's, it's very special. Yeah. 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 be there so and i guess that kind of segues into one of my favorite questions i like to ask is like what would you say some of your favorite aspects of the seminary world yeah and yeah, i'm sure this is the answer you've gotten every time but really you know the people that you yeah. you surround yourself with that 
there's the the classic phrase that you know it's not quite true but it's the general just as you you know what you walk away with from seminary is a you know your friends and a little list of books that you need to read to, to <laughs> yeah so that's so true some of them yeah. still like trying to find on amazon but yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, not entirely true you know it, you know there was a great education to be had um but really the the people are are a you know how you survive and be probably what you learn the most from you know i something that i think about a lot um is kind of going in i had a very even though i myself wasn't perfect at i had a very sort of strict mentality and something that you know i think another question you ask is you know what's the biggest struggle of, of the seminary too is is you know trying trying not to judge people you know someone who's not you know well you know they're not doing the same thing i'm doing therefore they must be doing it wrong right i think something um something that struck me was kind of that that's okay you know that that people are on their relationship with christ is something that is different than than mm -hmm. mine and what i'm called to do and to give is different than theirs you know and so there are people you know who would struggle with chapel attendance and you that's an easy one to kind of pick like i haven't seen them in chapel and, and, and it's a, that's a slippery slope too that's it's very easy to yeah, yeah 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 but then but then you kind of get to know that person and you know you see that oh well they're they're more charitable and loving than i could ever imagine being in my life and they spend all this time helping those in need and i've never even done that for a moment and so their their service and their ministry is something that's probably needed more than mine because when I'm in the chapel, I'm judging people some more and not praying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I think one of the best examples of that, uh, when I was a freshman, um, I think also obviously he was a senior uh, the year as a freshman, so he graduated right before he got there, but I'm sure you know who he is. Um, now he's a father, Peter Hasiakos. I'm not sure if he goes yeah. back to the Paniyoti. Yeah, he was, but, he was actually a big impact on, on me too, but yeah. Oh, no way. Okay, so so he's literally probably one of the most brilliant people um, that, that I've ever come across. And, you know, he was a senior and I was a freshman. So, you know, I see him, he was a chant group leader doing his thing and everyone just, he like, you know, everyone, you, he's kind of had this way about him. You could tell, man, this guy's very serious about the faith and he's very knowledgeable, but very like, you know, a kind person too. Um, but, you know, you're a little freshman and, and he's a senior. So it still is kind of like high school or like when you play sports, it's like, oh, the varsity players. And I was at the library one day my freshman year um working on like my uh my liturgical greek homework and and father peter hasiakos happened to be in there probably writing like you know a thesis or something doing like some serious work and he just like saw my my greek homework on my desk and he like picked it up and looked at it and i was like oh man this is like you know the michael jordan of, of greek is is grading my greek homework and he like put it down on the desk after he looked at it and he was like very nice he's like you just missed one little accent there and um as like mysteriously as he came he vanished and i was just like <laughs> whoa but for me it was very like inspiring because yeah. you, know, you always have the speaking of like chapel attendance it's like you always have the the idea of like what i should be like at the seminary yeah. and there, there are guys that check those boxes and it's like man um i need to be you know do this more like that guy but um those guys or probably the least likely to judge at all. And they like, and they probably understand this, yep. that everybody's different. And so all, you know, the only advice he wanted to give me was just a little tone as he could have probably said, Christo, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this. But he's just like, boom, little, little accent. And he was on his way. Yes. So those yes. are like special uh, interactions. Very, very memorable there. Yeah. 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 No, he was actually the one who, so like I said, I kind of had fumbled my way through chanting for five years and really know what I was doing. And so when I got to school, it was something I was really passionate about actually learning about was, you know, the, the theory behind it all and actually learning how to do it. Um, and then so he was chanting on the left side on Sundays my first year. Mm -hmm. Oh, because Menos would be on the other, or per yeah. Father Cardano. Yeah. Would Father be on the yeah. yeah. Um, and so he, he would be on the left side. And every Sunday, I think it was very early on, you know, I realized you know, the right side is the Greek side, which is good and fine, but I'd like to, you know, really learn how to chant in English, and he was doing English, so I would come early, and very early on, he was like, okay, you find me the books, okay, you, you know, you do all the stuff for me, you learn how to do it, and, and really, really bonded really well with him, and just the one year that we overlapped just at the chant stand, and really learned a lot about chanting, and about how, you know, how to carry yourself, and how to do everything at the chance stand from him, even though it wasn't in a classroom and it right. wasn't, 
I mean, probably on his end, he was trying to teach me, but it wasn't like, okay, here's our relationship. I'm your teacher. I'm, you're my student. Right. There was no syllabus in this. Yeah. 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 And so it was really, really a wonderful thing and, and learned a lot from him, you know, a, a student himself, you know, just by applying myself. And I think that's another good part of the seminary is that whatever it is that you do find your strong suit in. So those people who were good at, you know, serving the poor and hungry, you know, they found a way to really do that and to, they could work on that in their ministry. Those who really wanted to excel in this could do that. Those who wanted to excel in chanting could do that. And at the same time, you kind of get at least, you know, at least the basis of like, okay, how do I chant? If you weren't super passionate about it, you could at least maybe sort of get your, you know, do enough. Yeah. Uh, but if you really loved it, you could do a whole lot with it. And if you really love something else, you could do a whole lot with that. Definitely. So that, that was one of the cool parts about the, you know, educational side of things is sort of, you can really, you could really choose whatever you were passionate in. You could really push that and really learn a lot through that. Right. And that's what, that's what sustains you, you know, even into yeah. the industry, I imagine, you know, it's like those, those areas of, of interest like Byzantine chant, um, definitely different guys have different areas that they're in yeah. youth ministry, Byzantine chant, some um, catechism, and, um, and and there is really where you find the, the avenues to explore those more. Yeah. Very cool. So now we, we've talked a little bit about uh, the seminary experience and I'm just curious, um, now you're working as the uh, associate pastor at uh, the Holy Trinity Cathedral of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, how has, how have the, um, the expectations maybe you had um, while at the seminary of ordained ministry, how are they, you know, how have they lived up to those expectations, but in what ways is ordained ministry different than you might have ever expected while at the seminary? Yeah, it's, it's funny because there's a, there's a really, really powerful and interesting book um, called How Not to Be Secular. Huh. It's written, it's written by this guy who sort of is, is speaking about the, the world that we live in and how it's sort of, we almost kind of fake ourselves into believing that it's still Christian when in reality it's, it's not in any shape or form. And, and the introduction is almost, it's very accusatory almost. It's like, so you're reading this and you're probably a, a recent seminary grad and you've <laughs> gone to your church or your you know, parish, whatever, and, and you ready, you're ready to answer all the questions that all of your parishioners have about life and Christ. <laughs> yeah, and sure. You're ready to do all these things, and then you go there and you find out that these questions don't exist, and they don't even know what these questions are. And, yeah. And I think that was very true. You know, I kind of, I, I, I think as most seminary grads do, you come out and you're like, I'm gonna, you know, show, you know, I'm gonna be able to teach these people and help them and. Because I'm sure they're just, you know, dying to learn from me, the all wise. And, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I, I know yeah. what they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you get there and you realize that's not what they need. You know, they, right. you know, it's, and it's really been a very fascinating experience because you see people who really love the church more than you can imagine. People who spend, you know, probably more hours than I do at the church. You know building it, helping it, doing all this, this labor for it and all this ministry on top of their, you know, nine to five oh, jobs, on top of their, all these things. And they, they do this out of their love for the church because of what it's, it's given them. Um, and so I think that it's really been a, a powerful experience to see the love that the people have for the church. Um, and especially here at, at this parish at, at Holy Trinity, um, and how it's so ingrained in, in their lives and in, and in everything that they, they do and they know about themselves. Um, and so it's a very, a very powerful witness that, that that's the case. And I think that almost, almost kind of realizing myself, you know, the way that, that I was raised and how we gave so much to the church. But I, you know, in the same sense that I sort of wasn't fully in my own relationship with Christ and not knowing it. That, that was something that I could or should or yeah. or even how to go about doing that um, and I think I think really really it has to be a relational thing right you know and you can't really just walk in and on day one be like this is Christ and this is why you should do all these things for him and all and this things. is how he applies to your life yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Or learn it do it you know see if you get an A on the test tomorrow when I you know it, it really has to be a, 
a relational thing and it has to be something that that you show your yourself and again not being yourself not that it's you know me the all holy person but god um kind of reflecting off of you into them and so that then they see who who christ is and right and and why he's important to you and why he should be important to them yeah so it almost really you know calls you to an even higher bar i think than i think than i you probably think of going into it because you need to be not just showing this good example you know smiling and and all these things but you really have to have christ so ingrained in your heart and everything you do that they see when they see you they see christ not just sort of metaphysically and like right. that's you know when he's serving the liturgy he's, that's jesus you know kind of yeah thing. yeah but that like everything you do is is what christ would do and right then that hopefully draws people to christ not to you it's not about you or anything but then gives them that love and desire for for god you know definitely definitely and so along those lines um of ordained ministry and everything what would you say your your greatest joys of the priesthood are and how long have you been a priest now are we going up on two years kind of a little over a year and a half so i was ordained over 2020 in the midst of COVID, we of COVID. stuck it in, in, in that little lull between, you know, the first wave and the first wave. Right, where we kind of got to open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of okay, maybe. And so we, yeah. we went for it. Um, I was ordained actually in my home parish in, in Novato, um, uh, which is, you know, really a be beautiful thing. And I think I was able actually, almost because of COVID, because there wasn't really a whole lot that we could do at the church besides just serve liturgy and at that time Arizona was a little more open so we could have we had liturgy and you know we were wearing masks and all that but I was able to do my 40 liturgies for the 40 days after coordination which is you know it's grueling in that physical sense but I think in every other sense it was extremely rewarding and I think from that um, that's really something that I and Father Apostolos or Priest Dominos try and really do is have that robust liturgical schedule because awesome really everything else you could do at a Greek YMCA, you know, like you could yeah. have dance, you could have, you know, coffee socials, you could have all these things at a building that's not a church. Yeah, definitely. So the definitely. one thing you can do at a, at a church is have the services and, and that's, that's why we're here. And so really. Especially with two of you as well. Um, I don't know if you guys do them all together, but I imagine maybe that you do some, he does some, and maybe yeah. so it makes it when you have two praise, you can you can yeah. you have a full liturgical life. Yeah. Yeah. And now, I mean, now especially we um, don't have a chanter exactly available for weekdays. So then, you know, he can chant liturgy. Very I can nice. serve. Which is also kind of fun for a, a yeah. ordained priest to do to kind of like just, you know, take that step back and, and play the yeah. psalm every once in a while. Yeah. 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 No, it's a really, and it's a really beautiful relationship. And he's an amazing person, an amazing, you know, priest to, to learn under. and it's you know it's it's kind of not anything i expected but i also don't really know what i expected you know like I don't, it's it's hard to kind of put an expectation on on being a priest and but i think you know the easy high point you know being serving the liturgy and and the sacraments and and really also engaging with people and and being there along with them in their walk be it you know, all the highs and all the lows, you really get yeah. to, you know, a lot of times in society, you kind of, you know, everyone has that face you put on and you're like, oh, hey, is it going? You don't, you're not really, it's a great privilege really to be invited into those very intimate moments of pain and sadness and all the struggles that everyone is going through in, in this life. And so to be able yeah. to, to be there and, and hopefully bring Christ into it is really what it's all about. You know? That's awesome. Very yeah. nice, very nice. And um, one one final question, as we've we've come up on our hour already. Um, yeah. So, when you're not at the church, Father Alexander, um, what are what are you doing in your free time? What what are some of your hobbies that you know? Many of us tend to forget that priests, like you spoke about, the monks on Manathos, even like playing little jokes on right, uh, yeah. people sometimes. So, you know, they are normal people, and certainly um, our priests are as well. So, what are some of your hobbies that you do and uh, enjoy in your free time? Yeah, I mean that's the the. You know the other part of being a priest is your schedule is so all over sometimes we have morning liturgy you know a lot of times we have evening you know meetings events things so it's not as though you know every every evening i'm going to go do this thing you know i 
you and I are, I think you've mentioned maybe before, you know, we're in this group of guys who hold each other accountable in our, our fitness. And so I actually, we, I don't think we've gotten it to it on, on the podcast oh, yeah. yet, but um, yeah, yeah HCHC HD fantasy fitness. It was, yeah. a, it was a, it was a very, and it, it goes on, you know, throughout the seasons of the year, it's a very fun um, yeah. program that we have and to it, keep each it other. Gives me, it gives me that extra juice, you know, tired after a long day. It's like, no, I need to, you know, I'm going to work out because it's, it's something that's good for your body, soul, everything. And everything. Yeah. And it helps us stay connected to and be like, Hey, I did this workout. Are you, you know, what are you doing kind of thing? So definitely that and sports and able to um, play basketball every little bit here and there still. Um, and then most, most of the other time running after my, my two-year-old is a big hobby and for sure. He's, he's big into trucks. So kind of doing things. Ah, the truck trucks. phase. That's, yeah. awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So that's, you know, sports reading when I can and, you know, watching sports, playing sports, running after the sun, you know. Yeah, I believe, it. and we only have uh, 130 days left until football season, I think. So, we, yeah, yeah, we have a few group texts. One is football-oriented, one is fitness-oriented, and so yeah. we are, we're always uh, anticipating the return of football season. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Father Alexander, for uh, um, being with us today and sharing. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it, it was fun, man. It was uh, yeah. again, you know, people that you see every day for a few years at the seminary, and then you then you don't see them for years at a time. So yeah. uh, it's always fun to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gustav. You bet. For having me. You bet. And thank you all for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed, and we will see you next time on the path to the priesthood.